The Beer Hall Putsch, also known as the Munich Putsch, was a failed coup d'état by Nazi Party leader Adolf Hitler, General Karschermeister Erich Ludendorff and other Kampfbund leaders in Munich, Bavaria, on 8-9 November 1923, during the Weimar Republic. Approximately 2,000 Nazis marched on the Fellernhalle, in the city center, but were confronted by a police cordon, which resulted in the deaths of 16 Nazi party members and four police officers. Hitler, who was wounded during the clash, escaped immediate arrest and was spirited off to safety in the countryside. After two days, he was arrested and charged with treason. The putsch brought Hitler to the attention of the German nation for the first time and generated front page headlines in newspapers around the world. His arrest was followed by a 24 day trial which was widely publicized and gave him a platform to express his nationalist sentiments to the nation. Hitler was found guilty of treason and sentenced to five years in Landsberg prison, where he dictated Mein Kampf to fellow prisoners Emil Morris and Rudolf Hess. On 20 December 1924, having served only nine months, Hitler was released. Once released, Hitler redirected his focus towards obtaining power through legal means rather than by revolution or force, and accordingly changed his tactics, further developing Nazi propaganda. Chapter 1 – Background In the early 20th century, many of the larger cities of southern Germany had beer halls, where hundreds and sometimes thousands, of people would socialize in the evenings, drink beer and participate in political and social debates. Such beer halls also became the hosts of occasional political rallies. One of Munich's largest beer halls was the Burger Braukeler, which became the site where the putsch began. The Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, led to the decline of Germany as a major European power. Like many Germans of the period, Hitler, who had fought in the German army but still held Austrian citizenship at the time, believed the treaty to be a betrayal, with the country having been stabbed in the back by its own government, particularly as the German army was popularly thought to have been undefeated in the field. For the defeat, Hitler scapegoated civilian leaders, Jews and Marxists, later called the November criminals. Hitler remained in the army in Munich after the war. He participated in various national thinking courses, organized by the Education and Propaganda Department of the Bavarian Army under Captain Karl Meyer, of which Hitler became an agent. Captain Meyer ordered Hitler, then an army gefreiter and holder of the Iron Cross, first class, to infiltrate the tiny Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. Hitler joined the DAP on 12 September 1919. He soon realized that he was in agreement with many of the underlying tenets of the DAP, and rose to its top post in the ensuing chaotic political atmosphere of post-war Munich. By agreement, Hitler assumed the political leadership of a number of Bavarian revanchist patriotic associations, called the Kampfbund. This political base extended to include about 15,000 Sturmabteilung, the paramilitary wing of the NSDAP. On 26 September 1923, following a period of turmoil and political violence, Bavarian Prime Minister Eugen von Nilling declared a state of emergency, and Gustav Ritter von Kahr was appointed Staatskommissar, with dictatorial powers to govern the state. In addition to von Kahr, Bavarian State Police Chief Colonel Hans Ritter von Seisser and Reichswehr General Otto von Lorso formed a ruling triumvirate. Hitler announced that he would hold 14 mass meetings beginning on 27 September 1923. Afraid of the potential disruption, one of Kahr's first actions was to ban the announced meetings, placing Hitler under pressure to act. The Nazis, with other leaders in the Kampfbund, felt they had to march upon Berlin and seize power or their followers would turn to the communists. Hitler enlisted the help of World War I General Erich Ludendorff in an attempt to gain the support of Kahr and his triumvirate. However, Kahr had his own plan with Seisser and Lorso to install a nationalist dictatorship without Hitler. Chapter 2 – The Putsch The Putsch was inspired by Benito Mussolini's successful march on Rome. From 22 to 29 October 1923, Hitler and his associates planned to use Munich as a base for a march against Germany's Weimar Republic government. 
but circumstances differed from those in Italy. Hitler came to the realization that Kahr sought to control him and was not ready to act against the government in Berlin. Hitler wanted to seize a critical moment for successful popular agitation and support. He decided to take matters into his own hands. Hitler, along with a large detachment of SA, marched on the Bergerbraukeler, where Kahr was making a speech in front of 3,000 people. In the evening, 603 SA surrounded the beer hall and a machine gun was set up in the auditorium. Hitler, surrounded by his associates Hermann Goring, Alfred Rosenberg, Rudolf Hess, Ernst Hanfstangheil, Ulrich Graf, Johann Einer, Adolf Lenk, Max Eamon, Max Erwin von Skiabner Richter, Wilhelm Adam, Robert Wagner and others, advanced through the crowded auditorium. Unable to be heard above the crowd, Hitler fired a shot into the ceiling and jumped on a chair, yelling, the national revolution has broken out. The hall is surrounded by 600 men. Nobody is allowed to leave. He went on to state that the Bavarian government was deposed and declared the formation of a new government with Ludendorff. Hitler, accompanied by Hess, Lenk, and Graf, ordered the triumvirate of Kahr, Sisser and Lorso into an adjoining room at gunpoint, and demanded they support the putsch and accept the government positions he assigned them. Hitler had promised Lorso a few days earlier that he would not attempt a coup, but now thought that he would get an immediate response of affirmation from them imploring Kahr to accept the position of regent of Bavaria. Kahr replied that he could not be expected to collaborate, especially as he had been taken out of the auditorium under heavy guard. Heinz Panett, Johann N. and Skiabner Richter were dispatched to pick up Ludendorff, whose personal prestige was being harnessed to give the Nazis credibility. A telephone call was made from the kitchen by Hermann Kriebel to Ernst Rome, who was waiting with his Bund Reichskriegsflagger in the Lohenbrauchler, another beer hall, and he was ordered to seize key buildings throughout the city. At the same time, co-conspirators under Gerhard Rorsbach mobilized the students of a nearby infantry officer's school to seize other objectives. Hitler became irritated by Kahr and summoned Ernst Pohner, Friedrich Weber, and Hermann Kriebel to stand in for him while he returned to the auditorium flanked by Rudolf Hess and Adolf Lenk. He followed up on Goring's speech and stated that the action was not directed at the police and Reichswehr, but against the Berlin Jew government, and the November criminals of 1918. Dr. Karl Alexander von Müller, a professor of modern history and political science at the University of Munich, and a supporter of Kahr, was an eyewitness. He reported, I cannot remember in my entire life, such a change in the attitude of a crowd in a few minutes, Almost a few seconds, Hitler had turned them inside out, as one turns a glove inside out, with a few sentences. It had almost something of hocus-pocus, or magic about it. Hitler ended his speech with, Outside our car, Lorso, and Sisa. They are struggling hard to reach a decision. May I say to them that you will stand behind them. The crowd in the hall backed Hitler with a roar of approval. He finished triumphantly. You can see that what motivates us is neither self-conceit nor self-interest, but only a burning desire to join the battle in this grave eleventh hour for our German fatherland, one last thing I can tell you. Either the German revolution begins tonight or we will all be dead by dawn. Hitler returned to the antechamber, where the triumvirs remained, to ear-shattering acclaim, which the triumvirs could not have failed to notice. On his way back, he ordered Goring and Hess to take Eugen von Nilling and seven other members of the Bavarian government into custody. During Hitler's speech, Pohner, Weber, and Kriebel had been trying in a conciliatory fashion to bring the triumvirate round to their point of view. The atmosphere in the room had become lighter, but Kahr continued to dig in his heels. Ludendorff showed up a little before 2100 hours and, being shown into the antechamber, concentrated on Lorso and Sisa, appealing to their sense of duty. Eventually, the triumvirate reluctantly gave in. Hitler, Ludendorff, et al., returned to the main hall's podium, where they gave speeches and shook hands. The crowd was then allowed to leave the hall. In a tactical mistake, 
Hitler decided to leave the Burger Brauchler shortly thereafter to deal with a crisis elsewhere. Around 2230, Ludendorff released Carr and his associates. The night was marked by confusion and unrest among government officials, armed forces, police units, and individuals deciding where their loyalties lay. Units of the Kampfbund were scurrying around to arm themselves from secret caches, and seizing buildings. At around three o'clock, the first casualties of the putsch occurred when the local garrison of the Reichswehr spotted Rome's men coming out of the beer hall. They were ambushed while trying to reach the Reichswehr barracks by soldiers and state police, shots were fired, but there were no fatalities on either side. Encountering heavy resistance, Rome and his men were forced to fall back. In the meantime, the Reichswehr officers put the whole garrison on alert and called for reinforcements. Foreign attaches were seized in their hotel rooms and put under house arrest. In the morning, Hitler ordered the seizure of the Munich city council as hostages. He further sent the communications officer of the Kampfbund, Max Neunzert, to enlist the aid of Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria to mediate between Carr and the Putschists. Neunzert failed in the mission. By mid morning on 9 November, Hitler realized that the Putsch was going nowhere. The Putschists did not know what to do and were about to give up. At this moment, Ludendorff cried out, Via Marschieren. Rome's force together with Hitler's marched out, but with no specific destination. On the spur of the moment, Ludendorff led them to the Bavarian Defense Ministry. However, at the Odeon splits in front of the Fellern Halle, they met a force of 130 soldiers blocking the way under the command of State Police Senior Lieutenant Michael von Godin. The two groups exchanged fire which eventually resulted in the deaths for state police officers and 16 Nazis. Although their defeat by the government forces forced Hitler and Ludendorff to flee Munich, it was the origin of the Blutfahn, which was stained with the blood of two SA members who were shot, the flag-bearer Heinrich Trambauer, who was badly wounded, and Andreas Boridel, who fell dead onto the fallen flag. A bullet killed Skiabna Richter. Goring was shot in the leg but escaped. The rest of the Nazis, scattered or arrested. Hitler was arrested two days later. In a description of Ludendorff's funeral at the Fellern Halle in 1937 William L. Shirer wrote, the World War hero had refused to have anything to do with him ever since he had fled from in front of the Fellern Halle after the volley of bullets during the Beer Hall Putsch. However, when a consignment of papers relating to Landsberg prison were later sold at auction, it was noted that Ludendorff had visited Hitler a number of times. The case of the resurfacing papers was reported in Der Spiegel on 23 June 2006, the new information nullifies Shira's statement. Chapter 2 Section 1, Counter-Attack Police units were first notified of trouble by three police detectives stationed at the Lohenbrackler. These reports reached Major Sigmund von Imhoff of the State Police. He immediately called all his Green Police units and had them seize the Central Telegraph Office, and the Telephone Exchange, although his most important act was to notify Major General Jacob von Danner, the Reichswehr City Commandant of Munich. As a proud war hero, Danner loathed the little corporal and those Freikorps bands of rowdies. He also did not much like his commanding officer, General Lieutenant Otto von Lorso, a sorry figure of a man. He was determined to put down the putsch with or without Lorso. Danner set up a command post at the 19th Infantry Regiment barracks and alerted all military units. Meanwhile, Captain Karl Wilde, learning of the putsch from marchers, mobilized his command to guard Carr's government building, the commissariat, with orders to shoot at around 2300 hours, Major General von Danner, along with fellow generals Adolf Ritter von Roy and Friedrich Freier Kress von Kressenstein, compelled Lorso to repudiate the putsch. There was one member of the cabinet who was not at the Burgerbraukler, Franz Matt, the vice-premier and minister of education and culture. A staunchly conservative Roman Catholic, he was having dinner with the Archbishop of Munich, Cardinal Michael von Faulhaber and with the nuncio to Bavaria, Archbishop Eugenio Pacelli, when he learned of the putsch. He immediately telephoned Carr. When he found the man vacillating and unsure, 
Mack made plans to set up a rump government in exile in Regensburg and composed a proclamation calling upon all police officers, members of the armed forces, and civil servants to remain loyal to the government. The action of these few men spelled doom for those attempting the putsch. The next day the Archbishop and Ruprecht visited Carr and persuaded him to repudiate Hitler. 3,000 students from the University of Munich rioted and marched to the Fellern Halle to lay wreaths. They continued to riot until 9 November, when they learned of Hitler's arrest. Carr and Lawso were called Judases and traitors. Chapter 3 Trial and Prison Two days after the putsch, Hitler was arrested and charged with high treason in the Special People's Court. Some of his fellow conspirators, including Rudolf Hess, were also arrested, while others, including Hermann Göring and Ernst Hanfstangeil, escaped to Austria. The Nazi Party's headquarters was raided, and its newspaper, the Volkische Beobachter, was banned. In January 1924, the Eminger Reform, an emergency decree, abolished the jury as trier of fact and replaced it with a mixed system of judges and lay judges in Germany's judiciary. This was not the first time Hitler had been in trouble with the law. In an incident in September 1921, he and some men of the SA had disrupted a meeting of the Bayernbund which Otto Bollerstedt, a Bavarian Federalist, was to have addressed, and the Nazi troublemakers were arrested as a result. Hitler ended up serving a little over a month of a three-month jail sentence. Judge Georg Neithart was the presiding judge at both of Hitler's trials. Hitler's trial began on 26 February 1924 and lasted until 1 April 1924. Lawso acted as chief witness for the prosecution. Hitler moderated his tone for the trial, centering his defense on his selfless devotion to the good of the people and the need for bold action to save them, dropping his usual anti-Semitism. He claimed the putsch had been his sole responsibility, inspiring the title Führer or leader. The lay judges were fanatically pro-Nazi and had to be dissuaded by the presiding judge, Georg Neithart, from acquitting Hitler. Hitler and Hess were both sentenced to five years in Festungschaft for treason. Festungschaft was the mildest of the three types of jail sentence available in German law at the time, it excluded forced labor, provided reasonably comfortable cells, and allowed the prisoner to receive visitors almost daily for many hours. This was the customary sentence for those whom the judge believed to have had honorable but misguided motives, and it did not carry the stigma of a sentence of Gefängnis or Zuschthaus. In the end, Hitler served only a little over eight months of this sentence before his early release for good behavior. Prison officials allegedly wanted to give Hitler death guards, to prevent him from persuading them to free him. Although the trial was the first time that Hitler's oratory was insufficient, he used the trial as an opportunity to spread his ideas by giving speeches to the courtroom. The event was extensively covered in the newspapers the next day. The judges were impressed, and as a result, Hitler served a little over eight months and was fined 500 Reichsmarks. Due to his story that he was present by accident, an explanation he had also used in the Cap Putsch, along with his war service and connections, Ludendorff was acquitted. Both Rome and Wilhelm Frick, though found guilty, were released. Goring, meanwhile, had fled after suffering a bullet wound to his leg which led him to become increasingly dependent on morphine and other pain-killing drugs. This addiction continued throughout his life. One of Hitler's greatest worries at the trial was that he was at risk of being deported back to his native Austria by the Bavarian government. The trial judge, Neithart, was sympathetic towards Hitler and held that the relevant laws of the Weimar Republic could not be applied to a man who thinks and feels like a German, as Hitler does. The result was that the Nazi leader remained in Germany. Though Hitler failed to achieve his immediate goal, the Putsch did give the Nazis their first national attention and propaganda victory. While serving their fortress confinement sentences at Landsberg am Lech, Hitler, Emil Morris, and Rudolf Hess wrote Mein Kampf. The Putsch had changed Hitler's outlook on violent revolution to effect change. From then, his modus operandi was to do everything strictly legal. The process of combination, 
wherein the conservative nationalist monarchist group thought that its members could piggyback on, and control, the National Socialist movement to garner the seats of power, was to repeat itself ten years later in 1933 when Franz von Poppen asked Hitler to form a legal coalition government. Chapter 4 Fatalities Chapter 4 Section 1 Bavarian Police Friedrich Fink Nicholas Holweg Max Schobert Rudolf Schrout Chapter 4 Section 2 Putschists The 16 deceased are listed in Hitler's dedication to Mein Kampf. Felix Alfath, merchant, born 5 July 1901 in Leipzig. Alfath had studied merchandising at the Siemens Schuchert Works and moved to Munich in 1923 to begin his career. Andreas Boridel, Hatter, born 4 May 1879 in Aschaffenburg. Boridel was hit in the abdomen, killing him and causing him to fall on the Nazi flag, which had fallen to the ground when its flag-bearer, Heinrich Trambauer, was severely wounded. Boridel's blood-soaked flag later became the Nazi relic known as the Blutfahne. Theodore Casella, bank, clerk, born 8 August 1900. Wilhelm Ehrlich, bank, clerk, born 8 August 1894. Martin Faust, bank, clerk, born 4 January 1901. Anton Heschenberger, locksmith, born 28 September 1902. Oscar Corner, businessman, born 4 January 1875 in Oberpalau. Karl Kuhn, head waiter in a restaurant, born 7 July 1875. Karl Leforce, engineering student, born 28 October 1904, the youngest to die in the putsch. Kurt Neubauer, valet, born 27 March 1899 in Hopfengarten, Kreis Bernberg. Klaus von Pape, businessman, born 16 August 1904 in Auschwitz. Theodore von Derfurten, county court counsel, who had fought in World War I, born 14 May 1873 in Beirut, the eldest to die in the putsch. Johann Rickmers, retired cavalry captain who had fought in World War I, born 7 May 1881 in Bremen. Max Erwin von Skiabner Richter, Nazi leader, born 21 January 1884 in Riga. Lorenz Ritter von Stransky Griffenfeld, engineer, born 14 March 1889. Wilhelm Wolf, businessman, born 19 October 1898. Skiabner Richter was walking arm in arm with Hitler during the putsch, he was shot in the lungs and died instantly. He brought Hitler down and dislocated Hitler's shoulder when he fell. He was the only significant Nazi leader to die during the putsch. Of all the party members who died in the putsch, Hitler claimed Skiabner Richter to be the only irreplaceable loss. According to Ernst Röhm, Martin Faust, and Theodor Casella, both members of the armed militia organization Reichskriegsflagge, were shot down accidentally in a burst of machine gun fire during the occupation of the war ministry as the result of a misunderstanding with 2 infantry regiment 19. Chapter 5, Nazi Martyrs The 16 fallen insurgents were regarded as the first blood martyrs of the NSDAP, and were remembered by Hitler in the foreword of Mein Kampf. The Nazi flag they carried, which in the course of events had been stained with blood, came to be known as the Blutfahne and was brought out for the swearing in of new recruits in front of the Fellernhalle when Hitler was in power. Shortly after he came to power, a memorial was placed at the south side of the Fellernhalle crowned with a swastika. The back of the memorial read and ear hapt doc jessieged. Behind it flowers were laid, and either policemen or the SS stood guard between a lower plaque. Passers-by were required to give the Nazi salute. The putsch was also commemorated on three sets of stamps. Mein Kampf was dedicated to the fallen and, in the book Ich Kampfer, they are listed first even though the book lists hundreds of other dead. The header text in the book read though they are dead for their acts they will live on forever. The army had a division named the Fellernhalle Regiment, and there was also an SA Fellernhalle Division. 
Der 9. Elf became one of the most important dates on the Nazi calendar, especially following the seizure of power in 1933. Annually until the fall of Nazi Germany, the Putsch would be commemorated nationwide, with the major events taking place in Munich. On the night of the 8th of November, Hitler would address the Altkämpfer in the Bürgerbraukeller, followed the next day by a reenactment of the march through the streets of Munich. The event would climax with a ceremony recalling the 16 dead marchers on the Königsplatz. The anniversary could be a time of tension in Nazi Germany. The ceremony was cancelled in 1934, coming as it did after the so-called Night of the Long Knives. In 1938, it coincided with the Kristallnacht, and in 1939 with the attempted assassination of Hitler by Johann Georg Elsa. With the outbreak of war in 1939, security concerns caused the reenactment of the march to be suspended, never to be resumed. However, Hitler continued to deliver his 8 November speech through 1943. In 1944, Hitler skipped the event and Heinrich Himmler spoke in his place. As the war went on, residents of Munich came increasingly to dread the approach of the anniversary, concerned that the presence of the top Nazi leaders in their city would act as a magnet for Allied bombers. Every Gau was also expected to hold a small remembrance ceremony. As material given to propagandists said, the 16 fallen were the first losses and the ceremony was an occasion to commemorate everyone who had died for the movement. On the 9th of November 1935, the dead were taken from their graves and to the Felern Halle. The SA and SS carried them down to the Königsplatz, where two Ehren Tempel had been constructed. In each of the structures eight of the dead Nazis were interred in a sarcophagus bearing their name. In June 1945 the Allied Commission removed the bodies from the Ehren Tempels and contacted their families. They were given the option of having their loved ones buried in Munich cemeteries in unmarked graves or having them cremated, common practice in Germany for unclaimed bodies. On 9 January 1947, the upper parts of the structures were blown up. Since 1994, a commemorative plaque embedded in the pavement in front of the Felern Halle contains the names of the four Bavarian policemen, who died in the fight against the Nazis. The plaque reads. Den Mitgliedern der Bayerischen Landespolizei, die beim Einsatz gegen die Nazio Sozialisten Putschisten am 9 November 1923 ihr Leben lassen. Chapter 6 Supporters of the Putsch. Chapter 6, Section 1 Key Supporters. Chapter 6, Section 2 Other Notable Supporters. Chapter 6, Section 3 At the Front of the March. In the vanguard were four flag bearers followed by Adolf Lenk and Kurt Neubauer, Ludendorff's servant. Behind those two came more flag bearers, then the leadership in two rows. Hitler was in the center, slouch hat in hand, the collar of his trench coat turned up against the cold. To his left, in civilian clothes, a green felt hat, and a loose loden coat, was Ludendorff. To Hitler's right was Skiabner Richter. To his right came Alfred Rosenberg. On either side of these men were Ulrich Graf, Hermann Kriebel, Friedrich Weber, Julius Schreicher, Hermann Göring, and Wilhelm Bruckner. Behind these came the second string of Heinz Panett, Johann Einer, Gottfried Feder, Theodor von Derfurten, Wilhelm Kolb, Rolf Reiner, Hans Streck, and Heinrich Benecke, Bruckner's adjutant. Behind this row marched the Stostrup Hitler, the SA, the Infantry School, and the Oberländer. Chapter 6, Section 4, Chief Defendants in the Ludendorff-Hitler Trial. 